Welcome to the Modernizer Die Podcast, CFML News Edition, where we keep you up to date with everything going on in the Cold Fusion community. We'll share the latest news on events, releases to engines, frameworks, libraries, and tools, as well as spotlighting quality content from the community. Welcome to the Modernizer Die Podcast, CFML News Edition, in January 26, 2021. Welcome, Eric. Nice to have you. Thanks, Gavin. Glad to be here. Okay, well, before we get into all this news, and we got a lot of it this week, let's just thank our sponsors. So we want to thank Order Solutions, uh, because without them, this podcast would not be possible. And if you want to thank Audis, you can uh, go to cfcast.com and check out our new content that we're releasing all the time. Um, cfcast.com, there's free and paid content on there. Uh, sign up to get an account and see all the great stuff we have out there and we'll talk a little bit more about that later and we also want to thank our patron supporters and we got a new patron supporter this week so uh, we'll talk about them a little later as well but now we have 34 patreons supporting this podcast and they're providing 62 percent of our funding for this podcast so that's pretty cool so we thank everybody and uh, we even have a section of the podcast later on where we'll thank you guys a little more detail and tell you some of these great people's names so you can thank them yourself. Okay, so we do have some news and events, so uh, let's get into it. So, first up, uh, we have something at Charlie Earhart blogged about January 2021 updates for Java 11 and Java 8. So, if you're using Adobe Cold Fusion, uh, he wanted to make sure you guys are aware that Oracle released new updates to Java 11 and Java 8. Uh, th those are the current long-term support versions. Uh, and so those are basically the supported versions by Adobe CF. And so those are, downloads are available on the Adobe page now, and the Adobe actually offers those JVM updates right there. So if you want to learn more about it, how to use it, uh, etc., if you should update or not, and what some of the possible you know side effects might be, um, definitely go check that out. But it is a security um, update. It does have bug fixes, so it is something that is important. You should look at that. Um, and so if you're using uh, Java 11 or Java 8, um, you definitely want to read this blog post by Charlie here. So we're going to put that in the, in the show notes for you. Um, and again, thank you, Charlie, for going into a little more detail and explaining things for the rest of us to understand, right? Because <laughs> I don't do Java <laughs> that well. I admit it. It's not my strong point. Yeah, I'm, I've gotten so used to the niceties in command box, which you can specify a Java version right there for your server now. So Yeah, it's definitely nice. I mean, we use the open JDK in, in command box by default. So it's kind of nice. You just any version you want. <laughs> Put yeah. a number in the way it goes. So. Okay. Awesome. Well, the next thing we have there is also a new uh, Lucy release candidate out there. And if I'm remembering right, this is the one that is trying to introduce the new single mode, or is that the next version? Um, there's a lot of highlights in here. Uh, let me see if I can even share my screen for those uh, watching at home. Um, so the release candidate does have a lot of highlights. It's got um, some proxy in here. So there's a global proxy in the Lucy admin. Um, there's some dollar sign variables inside the Lucy config, which is kind of nice. Huh. So a little more <sighs> traditional They support. brought struct value array. I'm so happy. Yeah. I can't tell you how many times I've used that expecting it to work. And then CF Docs tells me the strangest thing. It tells me it's only on Blue Dragon. Like, what is that? <laughs> Blue Dragon, that's so, before your time. Uh, you should have is. talked to Charlie Earhart sometime about Open Blue Dragon. And, uh, that's yeah. awesome. Yeah, it's it's still on the CF Docs uh, website for sure. But yeah, so yeah, that looks like there's some great things here, some improvements to Query of Queries. That's all um, Brad's yeah. stuff. Yes, yeah, so that'll be really important. Uh, that's finally getting out there. So yeah. Awesome. Oh, oh my gosh. Yeah, there's a lot in here. So that's a pretty big thing. There's a lot of tickets if you want to find out more about them. Uh, Lucy's got all the tickets in here. But this is a, a pretty big release, this 5.38. I know it's been cooking for a while. And, uh, yeah, so it'll be good to good to get that out there. But, yeah, as like most things, if it's a release candidate, we need your help testing. And if you're using Lucy, I highly recommend you spin up a copy of it at least and just, you know, do some do some testing. I'm sure we'll get it added to mm -hmm. our little matrix for all our modules and our tests so we can get that out there and running too so yeah Especially. run your test suite see what see if anything breaks 
But, uh, you know, I have yeah, two sweets, make good. some. <laughs> um, but. John Farrar in the chat points out, and I saw this as well, Lucy says the next version will be 6.0. So Ooh. we're looking for a big jump here. Maybe some breaking changes. I know one of the things they talked about was combining or having an option rather to combine the server and web admins for oh. sites that don't need two different admins. So interesting. Some neat stuff coming up. Yeah, very cool. Good job. Good job, well, Lucy. Yep. So next up we have a, a new book coming out from Luis Mahano. Uh, he got a little bored uh, over Christmas and wrote a book. <laughs> Just kidding. He's been working on for longer than that. <laughs> but he does get inspired sometimes and comes up with new things. But um, yeah, so this was an, an idea that he brought up a while ago. And uh, a lot of the Autist team members have contributed some things. But basically the book is 102 Cold Box HMVC Quick Tips and Tricks. And uh, we've even got the cover designed on that. I'll show you that for those watching. So it looks pretty neat, um, but yeah. So we got a lot of a lot of cool content in there, and that's going to be coming out uh, pretty soon here. I think he wanted to to share the link. Uh, we'll get that to you as soon as we we have a link to shareable for everybody. So that should be coming out pretty soon. So keep an eye out, keep an ear out, and uh, yeah, we'll have you the information as soon as we have it available for everyone. So pretty exciting. Uh, there's a lot of good tips in there too. So. A lot of tips and tricks from those people that use Coldbox every day, and you know, and especially when we do trainings, we learn a lot of things that you know may be obvious to us, but they're not to everyone else who's learning it. So there should be some uh, some pretty cool things in there. Um, yeah. So, and John's like, is this a book of things he showed us in the Autist team over the last year, like the FAQ for Autists as a book? Um, probably, pretty much. Like anytime we get asked questions, we try and keep logs uh, of those types of things and. Yeah, if we get asked it enough, it'll show up on this type of list. But, but next up, uh, you have a security update to tell us about, Eric. Yeah, we have a blog post about it. Uh, if you're using Coldbox Elixir, you need to update and potentially rotate some secrets. Um, it was discovered that a code that referenced the process.env um, object in JavaScript would serialize the entire uh, environment. And so if you were running it in a build system and you were expecting it only to use one key, um, like many libraries tried to access the node EMV environment variable, it would actually serialize your entire environment. So not good, especially since that is shipped off to client browsers. So we have fixed the vulnerability in Cobot 3.1.7 and later, but we urge you to upgrade and rotate any keys that may have been affected. Yep. Yeah, that was not fun to find, but uh, yeah, it's unfortunate, guys... and we apologize for the the additional work it may cause you. Yeah, but we try to get it fixed as fast as possible. And if you have any questions, reach out to us in the Slack too, and and you know we'll see what we can do. But that that update should fix it, and it should you know explain explain in all the details you need. Okay, we also uh, had a, a new Lucy spreadsheet release. Um, Julian Halliwell, I believe, uh, is the maintainer of that project and released version 2.14.0, which is a, a pretty big change. They updated the, the POI library to version 5, uh, and it also does auto OSGI bundle loading for Lucy, so we no longer need Java Loader in Lucy. And I believe that Lucy spreadsheet, even though it's called the Lucy spreadsheet, will actually run in Cold Fusion. But yes. I wonder if it still will without the Java loader now with OSGI for Lucy. So just uh, no, I I actually looked into it because um, I was curious how he did it, and he's checking if he's able to use the OSGI loading, like checking if he's in Lucy, oh. and if he's not, uh, it still uses Java loader under the hood. Yeah. Um, but I'm excited. I know Adobe's been making some work in progress on um, loading bundles um, similarly, and you know. Java Loader is a great tool, but it will also be nice to have that built into the engines. So. Yeah, for sure. Okay, so next up on our list is kind of a big announcement uh, from the Autist team. And you may have seen it already, but we're happy to announce the Autist community. So uh, we've been working on this for a while, but long story short is our Google 
Google groups. Um, we had lots of Google groups everywhere, and they were, you know, hard to maintain and a little out of date. You know, Google groups hasn't got much love in a while, but now we have uh, an oldest community to sort of house all that in one location. Um, it's pretty neat that we're using Discords, and Discourse allowed us to import all those Google groups and imported every uh, user. So if you were a user in one of those groups, you're now a user in this as well. If you have multiple email addresses, you may need to merge them and stuff, but it keeps track of like when you uh, posted to Google groups. So like there's a full history is in there too. So uh, it's great to have everything in one location. And um, it, was, it was pretty neat like uh, that actually the just... <laughs> Just the sheer, the sheer size of everything and all the little badges and I mean it's it's a really nice little product and Lucy uses it for their stuff and a lot of places using Discourse so uh, we decided to use that and I mean the big ones for us is it's all in one place and it's way more Google friendly and and so I know the big question people have been asking though is so we're killing our Slack groups and we're like no Slack is still going to be there it's great for that communication that quick fire communication. Um, but we're hoping to use the community for more of the long-lived material, or if someone answers something inside of Slack, we'd like to take that and actually go over and maybe make a thread on the community mm -hmm. so it doesn't disappear into the history of Slack, you know, so. Yeah, I know Brad's been working on one of the plugins Discourse has um, to add a Slack command to our Slack teams that lets you, say, create a post from the last 20 messages. You know, because that is a huge thing that happens is we answer a question of Vern Slack because it's quick. It's able to get information back and forth really nice. But then it dies because we're not paying to, you know, for our community to have more than 10,000 messages. So this is our way to archive that and put it somewhere that can be searchable. I love that in Discourse, you can mark a post as the answer. So you can quickly go down and see, oh, look, this question I have has been answered. Um, yep. it's great. So yeah. we're excited. And we did look at all the options of like building our own. Cause some people say, why didn't you just build it? And we could, but you know, for the amount of features that discourse has, you know, we thought our, our time was better spent building other CFML tools that don't exist and you know, that we can make bigger and better. So we're using it. And, uh, so it's out there. So community.autosolutions.com, uh, check it out it should be uh you know it should have your user accounts there so you can reset your password if you have an email address for any of those other places and if you need to let us know and we can uh, merge accounts as well i know a few people had you know used different email addresses over the years and so they can merge all their content together so we can help with that just reach out on the box team slack or or how if you normally get a hold of us twitter works too but uh, yeah, so we're pretty excited to finally have that launched. And good work, Brad. You did a lot of good work on that. So. Okay. In case you missed it, last Friday we had a, our first Ortis webinar of 2021 on Command Box Task Runners by Grant Copley. So that will be coming to CF Cast tomorrow. You'll be able to view it there and catch up on all the latest task, Command Box Task Runner goodness. Yep. Okay. Next up, we have um, an online meetup. The CF online meetup has got one of our favorite people, Pete Freitag, is going to be presenting on securing a cold block. Uh, sorry, a cold fusion application with Fixnator and FuseGuard, and so hosted by Charlie Earhart, of course, in the online cold fusion meetup. So you can see that up meetup.com. Find out more information uh, about the session, etc. But it's a great session. Definitely go check it out. Uh, and they've already got 48 attendees signed up for it. I'm sure they'll have plenty more showing up tomorrow. Um, but Thursday. actually, not tomorrow, Thursday. Sorry, I messed that one up. Yeah, so that is this Thursday, January 28th, 11 a.m. Central Time. So, again, Pete's uh, great. He'll scare the pants off you, but he'll motivate you to make your app more secure. And he's going to show a couple of tools that he built that help you do that. So that's really cool, too. Speaking of the online CF meetup, in case you missed the one from the week before, we had communication skills for technical engineers and developers with Mark Takata. So we'll post the link to the recording into the show notes and to the chat. And I didn't know that Mark Takata was Fat Panther until we had our conversation about that last week. So <laughs> Brad, I, I guess that. that's on Twitter or <laughs> yeah, Fat Panther on Twitter. So. Okay. <laughs> Never knew until Brad told me last week. So, okay. So, 
with that being said, let's jump over to our conferences. So, VS Code Day is this week, this tomorrow, Woo! January 27th. There is a special conference. It's only a short conference. So, 8 a.m. to 10.30 a.m. Pacific time. There's going to be five sessions by the VS Code team. There will even be a hints and tips and tricks session. Uh, there will be some great ones using Docker as well. Um, and so that's all available on code.visualstudio.com slash VS Code Day. Uh, and it's, again, like most of these online conferences, they're free and available for you. So if you check it out here, put in your email address and sign up, and then they'll email you about that. Uh, you can add it to your calendar and then the cool thing is they're doing a restream tomorrow night so those in different time zones uh, that can't make that time or if they're unavailable due to meetings uh, or work or family life there's a restream at 8 p.m to 10 30 p.m pacific and uh, that'll be useful for like i said a lot of different people but here are the sessions again they've got some really uh, top-notch members presenting whoa and they're actually got more sessions now so they've got added a few more so they're short little 20 minute sessions by the look of it um, so that's even better I know a lot of people are going towards the shorter session set up in conferences these days so just enough to get in there and get what you need to and get out so I'm excited about that I'm hoping I can check some of that out tomorrow if my meetings allow me to okay next, next up yeah we also have Dev Nexus coming up next month uh, I know right, Brad this is that one. Yeah, yeah, this ahead. is one of our favorite Java conferences, Java and GVM languages. Um, like uh, Gavin was going to say, Brad and Luis are our usual reps going there, letting people know about CFML, that it's still live, not just alive, but kicking and doing well. Um, but it's, you know, we have Java underneath all our applications, and it's good to know all of the power we can tap into. So it's good to see Admiral Akbar there uh, doing the closing keynote, too. <laughs> oh, so. look at that. Yeah. All right. So a lot of good, uh, <laughs> a lot of big sponsors, a lot of good content there. So uh, another good one if you're looking at Java or, um, you know, some of the other solutions as well related around Java. So there's Docker and other things like that too, Kubernetes, etc. So there's probably some content for you even if you don't do too much in the Java world these days. There's always something that applies. <sighs> Next up. We have some uh, Autis updates. So we have news on our Autis workshops. And I know that you mentioned on to, in response to it, the question, when will there be a quick workshop? And I think you threw out a date there for John because John's, he better be the first sign up. <laughs> but <laughs> I know we're looking at a, possibly a March date for that quick workshop, right? Right. Um, so we'll also be... Um, doing workshops for command box zero to hero call box zero to hero call box here to superhero as well uh, those dates will be announced as we go through the year um, so we're getting those dates but they should be coming soon and as we mentioned in the last podcast um, we're still not sure exactly what we're going to be doing for orders conferences we were thinking about doing more conferences then we changed our mind to maybe doing less and so we're thinking about maybe doing it into the box online in may uh, and that maybe changing this, the format instead of being like two tracks over two days and we might do more of a developer week style where we have a session just one session like one track but space them out a little more and in turn have a little more uh interaction with the you know people in between sort of so we're looking at that in may and then into the box latam we probably have in december probably online so um yeah so that's that's basically what we're looking at there and i'm glad john is a uh, appreciative um oh luis is in the chat he's saying september not may well last time we talked luis you you said not september would move it to may but that's okay whatever we decide to do <laughs> we'll let you know um again we're still undecided we're not sure so as we there find out an, you will find out <laughs> there will be an into the box this year when yeah. and format is still up pending in the air, but that's where developments we'll be in. in the world <laughs> yep but um we also have uh more conferences are available on comps.tech and uh, that's a, a cool little website and um, it has a lot of different conferences so if you're looking for other other languages or communities or even just specialties they have some pretty good stuff on there and uh, we do mention it periodically and so you know there's quite a few in February etc so if you're looking for UX stuff or you know 
looking at front end love. There's all sorts of different things in here, uh, other languages. But now, if we go to the top, we should see the option when you submit a new one for, um, I think I have the link here somewhere. And I'll have a link for Cold Fusion as well. So that Woo! link, let me see if I can share it. Under a topic, we now have Cold Fusion CFML. So thank you to the community for stepping up and uh, giving them a little grief. Um, they they said <laughs> originally that they weren't going to add it because it was kind of a dead language. <laughs> and then a few of us uh, got on there and said, actually. <laughs> and then they said, oh my gosh, I, we think we pissed off a really active and loving community. Uh, that was bad. <laughs> we shouldn't have done that. And so they apologized for it and added it to the list. And and you know they said they're they're happy to have us and they gave us this link and said please start adding your conferences so as soon as we have any uh conferences dates for any of the cold fusion conferences we will be adding it to that list so um but yeah it was nice of them to you know admit whoops we might have offended somebody and uh, <laughs> and fix that and they were johnny on the spot with it too they're really nice about it they just they just weren't aware so again we got to make sure people know that uh yeah, we're still out there, right? <laughs> yeah, so. I, I'm going to post a link to the PR that was made because um, it, it, it's been open for a while, this pull request to get it added um, yeah. since like the end of 2019. And uh, he finally, the one of the maintainers finally closed it. And yeah, it was like five comments in a row. And I just, it was a, it was a good example of our community and also, you know, a Good listening on the part of the um the conference site the comp stop tech yeah and so they were they were kind of surprised that you know that we mentioned it i'm like every week it's there it's in our show notes every week so you know pretty cool like i say i like supporting those little websites too you know they offer a service and i found out about some pretty cool content that i wouldn't have found without it you know so especially because a lot of those other places um don't exist anymore like it wasn't lanyards.com or something a place you could go look at community like conferences and see who was presenting at which ones and stuff but i think that got shut down and a couple of others like it did too so mm -hmm. anyways next up let's talk about some blogs tweets and videos of the week so yeah. first up we have one from ben Adele, and i think you were talking about this one so maybe i'll let you speak a little bit more about it sure so ben explores using building um regular expression match groups using uh re find both in adobe cold fusion 2018 and lucy 5.3.7 because there's some differences um so the idea here is in a regular expression that you surround with parentheses you get those out as groups and um, he kind of goes into the differences and how he can use that to get those groups out as an array. Um, I actually <laughs> just kind of agree with his last point, which is he shows it using Java's pattern matcher, which is so much nicer. Cold Fusion's uh, regular expression built-in stuff is just okay. Um, <laughs> the fact that you have to loop over your own groups to find them makes me sad, but um but yeah they, ben's article goes through how to do that the differences between the engines and then shows the java example yeah um i believe ben has even released a an, a cfc at least of like using java the back regular expressions so he does like his regex that's for sure that's true in fact i think this was built off of uh some regex work he did in another one of his blog posts we'll talk about yeah. So yeah, my takeaway was use use the Java version, but uh, <laughs> you you may have a different takeaway. <laughs> yeah, for sure. So next up, we have that one from Charlie, which is talking about the Java 11 and Java 8 uh, updates. And again, you know, which version should you be using? You know, how to configure it for the new Java update. Um, and then you know, as usual, lots of links, lots of good information there from Charlie, and um, always lots of details. So. If you're using one of those versions, please read and, and look at this information. Uh, make sure you configure it right and get that updated for your own security needs. Okay. We had a, a tweet to uh, Adobe about their Adobe Summit where they were asking a question about a bunch of programming languages that people may use, and Cold Fusion wasn't listed, so uh, David Levin was kind of shaming Adobe on that. 
Yeah, there's a couple other people too, but this one was funny because, you know, he took the screenshot too. Like, there's a few others out there. Like, it's not like there's a short amount. Yeah. Um, but I, I obviously responded to this one saying, um, hopefully, yeah, other people don't get confused between Adobe Summit, the Digital Experience Conference, and Adobe CF Summit, because obviously it'd be it'd be worse if they forgot about Cold Fusion on their own conference about Cold Fusion. But this is not quite the same conference, but. It's still, still important that they uh, don't forget about us. But yeah. it's like you're in a different res- reality sometimes. Yeah, I think you you responded exactly with that. That sometimes it feels like Adobe, like I don't know, like a subsidiary or like a sister company must hold Cold Fusion because they never think about it. <laughs> yeah. So. Well, back to um, some regex stuff. James Moberg said the Ari replaced no case used to crash a server because text fragments were too large. Adobe acknowledged it but never fixed it. So now we use it as a replace all. Oh, okay, brother. well, let's get into uh, some passing strings from Ben because uh, yeah. he had a blog it, post on this as well. If I can interrupt, though, I did find Ben's regular expression wrapper around Java. And so I'm going to put that in the show notes. Oh, great. Because again, I feel like it does a better job and does it in a more succinct way. <laughs> So we'll paste that in. Your mileage may vary, but that is what I found for myself. Cool. Okay. So this is a little code cutter that um, Ben was working on about passing strings like 5 meg into a number of bytes. And so uh, in a blog post we'll share in a minute here, he was streaming an incremental zip file up to Amazon S3 with Lucy, and he was at to wait until the chunks were over 5 megs before he could upload them. Uh, and so basically he was, you know, processing and wanted to get through it. And so he did some work uh, in this one here. And so he did like a little code cutter. Um, it was kind of interesting. I mean, reading through these blog posts, I always find them very interesting. What Ben does and how he figures it out and, you know, like trying to convert stuff. But again, it's like we shouldn't have to work this hard to upload a file to S3, right? Uh, I know streaming <laughs> the zip incrementally makes it a little more tricky and maybe you've got to do that. But I know the S3 libraries and the command lines and everything is just so much easier. And, you know, you don't have to worry about splitting it up because as he says, yeah, you have to basically chunk the files when you're uploading to S3. And so this is his math and trying to figure out if something, you know, was big enough and, you know, based on the size and everything. So yeah. I want this up as a uh, Fortbox module, Ben. Let's make it happen. Yeah. The live stream getting this published. Yeah, I, mean, I think it'll be pretty good because I mean that's, there's a lot of good stuff in here, and like I say maybe the streaming the zip is where the normal uh, you know S3 modules on Forgebox just sort of fall short or something. So, but it was pretty interesting, and again that's that sort of started that other blog post, right? It talked about the the replaces. So, but uh, yeah, pretty interesting process. And then, of course, we have the actual blog posts, which started it all. <laughs> <laughs> and so this one from Ben is about creating and incrementally streaming a zip to Amazon using S3. And so the other day, or I think it was last week, he actually built the the incrementally streaming a zip to the browser, you know, for using Lucy, which was pretty neat. I, I thought that was pretty cool. And so that's what made him think, well, maybe I can do this and zap it to S3 as I build it, which is pretty cool. And so, as usual, I like the ones that videos as well. So, um, pretty, pretty good. It goes into some some pretty good detail. Um, but yeah, the the five meg thing would kind of a weird one. But so you have to keep going, keep going until the file's big enough, and then push up that slice, and then continue. So it's pretty pretty interesting. But like like you said, it'd be nice to have this as a module because I can see a good use case for it. I mean, it's Again, uploading stuff, a full file that you have the complete file is a different story. It's pretty easy with S3, but the whole incrementally creating and streaming would be nice to have. So, yeah, but yeah I mean, I, I thought this is a, again, really detailed, a tr- traditional bin blog post, really detailed, lots of great code. Um, I don't know, maybe we should just have a an AI that takes Ben's blog post, takes the code, and creates Forgebox modules automatically for it. Because <laughs> most of them would be pretty useful. Uh, so. That would be a really fun bot that just scrapes <laughs> Ben's blog and makes modules. <laughs> we'll call it the Ben bot. <laughs> it's like it's like all the stuff where people joke about Stack Overflow, where you it like 
you can put in your problem. It will go to Stack Overflow, pull the the marked answer and paste it into your code editor. I think there's a VS Code plugin for that. <laughs> we need one for Ben's blog. Find the best match and just take his code and post it, paste it in. That sounds like a pretty good <laughs> module. I mean, we should at least put that on the VS Code and tip and trick of the week for for at least just for a laugh. Uh, I think it's most else. more of a joke, but uh, maybe not. <laughs> <laughs> I'm saying it'd be a good fun one. You know, maybe for yeah, uh, April, April Fools we can do that this year. <laughs> there you go. Yeah. Okay. Well, so we already talked about the Lucy uh, release candidate, so um, we'll share the link for that too. And we also have another one: a Happy New Year blog post from uh, Gregory Alexander who is working on the Galaxy blog, and so he wants to wish everybody a Happy New Year and also, um, you know, basically give us an update on what he's been doing and what he's been working on. So the the long story short, um, he basically didn't spend much time lately blogging because he wanted to spend all his time uh, in his after hours working on the blog. And so he's uh, completely overhauled the, the blog it's all written in Cold Fusion RM now because he was doing everything in old school SQL because he wanted to make it more cross platform uh, for the different database servers. He completely rewrote the administration section from scratch and now supports mobile devices. And um, so the the cool thing he says is like, yeah, he wanted to be able to go to a national park and take a photo of his phone, and upload it naturally in his phone without having to do anything weird. So um, that's part of the motivation for the completely mobile admin screens for him. Um, but yeah, so again, just some of the updates here, and you can find out more on it on the, Gal- the GregoryAlexander.com blog. So pretty cool. I wondered if what he'd been up to because for a while there he was blogging a lot and making lots of updates, but I know he did spend some time diving into that. So, so John is asking in the chat, what is Galaxy Blog? So John, um, Galaxy Blog is basically Gregory's blog that he started building. I know that he, I think he built it on top of blog CFCs to sort of take it and evolve it because he wanted to create a new open source uh, blog. Um, yeah, so as Charlie said, it's a fork modernization of blog CFC. So uh, he started evolving it, a lot of focus on the front end, you know, usability and, you know, that type of thing. And so um, it was, yeah, so it's sort of been a process evolving it over time and that's where it's at so it's pretty pretty lightweight and everything uh and again he's focusing a lot on the front end stuff so so yeah so we're trying to share all different things so uh there we go Alrighty. next we have a blog post from pete freitag about session invalidate and jee sessions so in cold fusion the default session is um, a cold fusion session, you know, using the CFID and CF token, but you can use an, the underlying J2EE sessions, like a J session ID. The session invalidate function that CFML has does not invalidate the J2EE session. So you can dip down into Java to do that. Pete has a uh, code snippet that you can use for that as well. So if you're using the J session ID type sessions, You'll probably want to look into this. I believe session invalidate usually is called um, what, on logging out, correct? Um, Most of I our, think, I think so, our CV yeah. auth stuff all does this for us. So I I did it once and now I've forgotten. Yeah. <laughs> it's hard to keep track, but yeah, I, I think so um, on the logout. And I think you can, like I said, obviously manually call it too if you need to. But. All right. Okay. Um, we had a live stream this week with uh, Matt Clemente. He was working on retaining function order when reading CFC metadata. So Matt has been working on a command box command that generates markdown documentation based on the CFC docs when you call get metadata on a CFC. Um, but all the functions in there come back alphabetical by default. So he was working on um, ordering those in the order they appeared in the CFC, in the file. You mean you don't order your functions alphabetically in your files? Not usually. <laughs> I mean, I, know I, do tr- I do try to think about it, but alphabetical is not the way. Yeah. I, just... I kind of tend to go from the highest level, like the API the user will use, and then inside there, when I you know call other functions that need to exist, those functions will go right underneath. So you can kind of just 
keep going down as deep as you need to go. So yeah, that makes sense. There's lots of different ways. I'm just teasing you, but. <laughs> Yeah, so it's good to see Matt live streaming again, and yeah, it seems like he's been doing Fridays when he's done it lately. So, uh, you know, if you're around on Fridays, keep an eye out on Twitter because he'll he'll throw that up there and jump in, and it's always fun to watch. You know, Matthew work through these. So, okay, we also had the blog post from you about the Coldbox Elixir V3 security update, which we talked about earlier. So we'll we'll let you guys uh, chase that one down. We also had. Another blog post from Pete. Pete's been busy this week. He's going to be busy later on in the week, too. Um, so basically, we're uh, updating Java and ColdFusion and Lucy. So, you know, if you're not using Hack My CF, um service, it'll basically tell you when things are updated. You know, that's one way to keep up to date on when, when things are being released. Um, and then he's even got a video there to show you how to update it on 2018. So there's some links out there. You know, explaining all the different versions and what you should use. Again, uh, Pete's, you know, Pete's the guy to talk to about security and cold fusion, and so a lot of this stuff here is really useful. So um, I like the fact that he actually explains some of the differences between the different versions of Java and stuff. I know we've talked about that on previous shows too. Um, and again, what happens if you don't update Java? These are, you know, some of the things that. Things might start breaking, uh, some vulnerabilities, etc. So, I like the fact that he you know, spells it out nicely for for everybody. So, another solid blog post there. Okay, we've talked about the Ordis community, and there is also a blog post to go along with it. It talks about some of the awesome things that we've built into it, how to access it. Um, yeah, so, but, uh, we well, really hope to see you all over there in the Ordis community. Yep. I like some of the cool badges that Brad's done too. So if you're a Patreon supporter, you've got a special badge. If you're a contributor to some of our projects, uh, Brad did some, you know, some queries to figure out who's been top contributors. So a lot of them are being got little special badges too. So, you know, if you're active in the community and stuff, you can earn some, some cool badges too. So, you know, but for those who like that type of thing, so <laughs> everybody, right. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. We all live for the badges and the achievements. So, yep. <laughs> so uh, Brad also posted a blog post on his personal um, blog here too. We're talking about how you can create these cool little toaster pop-ups, uh, even if you're running like a, a UI-less um, headless server, basically. Uh, and so you can tap into the display message through the internal Java class in the server. <laughs> And you can make them pop up just like when you start your server. Normally, there's a little server saying, you know, a little pop up saying that your server is started on this port, etc. The command box. And you can tie straight into it from the code. So, uh, as he says, have fun with this, but don't abuse it. <laughs> um, and he says, <laughs> I can see some neat things with command box modules on this. You know, giving you a a toaster pop up when you need to, like in a watch or something. Yeah, that sounds pretty cool. And that was the thing is that, yeah, it's probably better for like developmental purposes or whatever. Um, yeah, if you're spinning yeah, off a service but... or you're recompiling your Elixir stuff or something, can pop up and say, you know, new stuff built, reload your page type stuff. Or you know. One clarification, um, this does not work on like Windows as a, a Windows service or a headless server. Um, in fact, I would be interesting, interested if it would blow up command box. I do know using Linux that... I've had to disable the system tray stuff because it will just <laughs> completely hose my servers. Yeah, I so, think the latest update did uh, remove that from those servers that weren't capable yeah. of showing it, I believe. Um, so yeah. just keep that in mind that if, you know, where you're using this code, again, I think in command box commands or task renders is your safest bet um, because you don't want to be running that on somewhere that it will just blow up the whole... <laughs> no, the whole command box instance <laughs> so brad if you're listening uh if this blows up somewhere you should probably fix that <laughs> so okay we also had a, a new blog post um not sorry blog post podcast so ben adel and his little podcast crew the working code podcast has released episode six hopes for 2021 uh, and they said this was recorded the day after the capital was stormed so um it basically they're trying to think of positive things for you know 2021 so this 
talks about all that. And uh, they even got their first Patreon supporter too on that podcast. So that's kind of cool. So, but yeah, so if you can go check it out on there. And they have it available on, um, what's it called? Red Circle. That's right. I'm trying to remember the name of that platform they're using. So, cool to see another podcast in the community. Not CFML directly related, but obviously some community members from CFML. So, okay. We also had a, a blog post from David Byers who took my uh, cold box training uh, last yeah, he's, year. He's released a few uh, different posts on it. This is the third and presumably final part, according to him, about um, how this course changes impressions of cold box and frameworks in general. Yeah, so he talks about having to relearn how to let go. Um, you know, he talks about pros and cons about how cold box works because if you don't like cold box and the way it works, you can change a lot of things. But he says, well, if you do that though, there's some pros and you know pros and cons. So he talks about some of them, and you know, and if you change the conventions, it might muddy the water. And um, you know, so maybe maybe you should just be a purist and do it the way that cold box expects it to be. Um, you know. But long story short, if we go to the bottom parts, he says learning cold box and a, and adapting its adopting its practice has been a positive experience, and you know, and so he's like, hundred percent, he won't use it all the time necessarily. Um, you know, there's pros and cons to everything, but you know, he thinks it's a valuable tool to keep in his toolbox, and you know, it's, it's a positive experience. But if you want to find out more about it, go read it from him. We might be a little biased, so that's why I don't want to say too much about it, and I'll let you guys decide on your own. But it was nice to have a, you know, a, an unbiased, uh, you know, sort of exploration there. So, so yeah, and David does write quite a lot on the blog post there. So, and John's saying he's cold box doesn't make you live in a box. Um, I'm kind of in a little box right here. <laughs> no, you don't have to <laughs> choose to, but uh, yeah, no. You don't have to, and they say that's one thing a lot of people do misconceive about cold boxes. They think you have to do everything our way or the highway, but you can change a lot of things. I mean, you can change the folder conventions. You can change a lot of different things about it. I mean, and with interceptors, like you can change the way a lot of things happen because you can intercept, you know, key events in the life cycle and do things differently. So, you know, that's that's what makes cold box so powerful. But like David did say, if you change a, you know, a lot of stuff in the way Coldbox works, you lose some of the benefits because a lot of the cool things about Coldbox, it assumes certain things, and so it behaves assuming those things are there and working the way they are. And so if you follow those conventions, everything will work easier. Otherwise, you have to do, you know, you do have to make a few changes, you know. So that's just one of the, it's just one of the things. I think there was. Um, something i read the other day about you know certain pieces were expecting things to live in a certain location and if not you have to add a mapping or something you know like it d if it doesn't know where it lives you got to tell it where it lives so if you keep it in the same place it knows where it is otherwise you're gonna have to tell tell it hey actually i put you over here you know uh stuff like that and there's a lot of system files that are installed you know you can move them out of your root web roots and do all sorts of stuff but it's something you have to configure so Anyways, but that was a, a good blog post, and like I said, I'm glad it's positive. Uh, you know, David's a great guy and a good member of the community, so I'm glad it went well, and thanks for sharing that. Okay, so next okay. up, find a job. Oh, I believe there's one more we have in the... Oh, did I miss one? I'm sorry. It's about the oh. internationalization. The CBI-18N module has its V2. So a couple of weeks ago, we covered a new module by Mr. Will de Bruyne about using, um, I'm trying to remember the name, had JSON on, in it. Yeah. But, uh, <laughs> yeah. but yeah. Um, his work was uh, pivotal to getting this V2 out for CBI-18N. Um, in fact, it's most of his work. Luis has gotten that finalized and released, and you can go use it now in version 2. Yep, I think uh, we we mentioned the release had happened, but the blog post hadn't really happened last week. So, Got it. yeah, so this blog post gives you a little more details that we were kind of light on. So, very cool. Sorry, I missed that one. I, I thought I had the, already gone that far down, but I must have saw your cursor instead of mine. So, cool, cool. Okay, so now let's talk about jobs of the week. And for that, we'll go to the site that we seem to use all the time, 
get cfmljobs.com. So as we mentioned last week, there was like 14. <laughs> uh, we do think most of them were the same posts, just posted in different cities, but there are still two new ones. So there's a new Cold Fusion application developer in Bengaluru, Karnataka, in India. And then there's a Cold, senior Cold Fusion developer at Stennis Space Center. And so that one is in, um, those were both posted this last week. So a couple of good jobs there. So Space Center, that sounds fun. I know. I have a bit of fun with some of my projects that might be related to space or not. Um, so that one's in Mississippi, right? I uh, yeah. I think so. I always I have to double take on all your states that start with M because I didn't grow up with them. So I'm like, uh. yes, <laughs> <laughs> yes. So I'm always like, wait, is it Mississippi, Missouri. I'm like, yeah, I'm pretty sure it's Mississippi. <laughs> And John's giving me crap about it. I'm like, I don't want to say the wrong one, so I just didn't say any. <laughs> <laughs> so, okay. So next up, we have our Forgebox module of the week. And so this yeah. one, I was actually wondering if Brad was going to be on the show to talk about it, but he's not, so we can uh, make something up for him. Uh, but uh, this is... <laughs> <laughs> we've... we've been doing a lot of work lately with RabbitMQ um, queues and also the stomp feature it has which is a way to send websocket messages back and forth on the queue and one thing that we wanted to look into for one of our clients was is there a way to use an, an existing websocket connection to make what we would normally use an ajax request for because we have this websocket open we're communicating back and forth some of the http requests we needed to make would happen quite often and with each http request you have to do the whole TCP handshake again, right? Got to make sure that you're connected, send the data back, whereas WebSocket is persistent. And so um, Brad dived deep into the call box internals and uh, making it so that the data that came over the stomp message could look to cold box like any other um, request, you know, complete with CGI variables, uh, URL and form scopes, all the things that you might expect in a uh, call box action and then you can call the action that you need so it's pretty cool we have it's called rest over stomp um and you can call any event via this websocket listener that you need so yeah that's pretty neat uh he did a show and tell for us and it's pretty impressed and of course that got him thinking about other things because the stomp stomp js library i think can actually communicate with other things not just rabbit mq as well so you know the option is to to build on top of this and expand it to, to other libraries as well so pretty neat so yeah very cool i know that they're yeah he's doing a lot of good work with it it's pretty nice and so as john said brad gets geek of the week badge <laughs> is that a new badge on discourse uh maybe we'll have to make one <laughs> cool okay so next up we have our vs code hints tips and tricks of the week and this one is actually uh kind of a, a, a new one here and i thought we'd done it before but there's a few similar to this but this is a little different so it's visual studio and telecode that's got almost 10 million installs from microsoft um but this is what confused me because we have other things that use AI assisted development. And so essentially it's an IntelliCode extension. Uh, and then depending on the language that you're using, um, AI assisted will help you try and figure out what you're trying to do. So it'll be in IntelliCode based on that. Um, and so it's not set up for Cold Fusion yet. Sorry, everybody. But I know a lot of us do JavaScript or maybe TypeScript with our apps. Uh, and so this is something that will um, definitely help. And so you'll see it's actually using intelli you know, AI to be able to figure out what you're actually wanting to, to use for completion. So uh, obviously VS Code has some of that built in, but this just takes it a little better, improves it a little more. Um, and again, for JavaScript, you don't have to do anything special. Um, for Python, you know, you have to do these certain steps. If you're using Java, you can uh, use a Java tutorial to get your Java server extension, uh, language server up and running, etc. So um yeah but there are some you know some improvements on this intellicode so i thought that was pretty cool and yeah. want to share that with everybody as well so that's our hint tip and trick of the week remember don't forget that we have uh the vs code day 
tomorrow. If you're listening live, it's tomorrow. If you're not listening live, it's probably already passed. So, <laughs> but, uh, That's why you listen yeah. live, folks. <laughs> yep, for sure. Okay, so um, next up we have our Patreon supporters. And we have a new one this week. Yeah, thank you and welcome to our new supporter, Leon Saramelis. If yep. that is not how you pronounce your name, please get a hold of us so we can pronounce it right every week. <laughs> yep, for sure. So uh, we are so grateful for our Patreon supporters. You support this podcast, our open source initiatives, um, Forge Box, Command Box, Cold Box, all the boxes. And you can learn more and support us at patreon.com slash order solutions. And yep. we would like to take a moment now to thank each of you. So... Thank you to Ben Nadal, Brett DeLine, Carl Von Stetten, Charlie Earhart, Dali, Dan Card, Daniel Garcia, David Bellinger, Didier Lesnicki, Don Bellamy, Edgardo Cabezas, Eric Hoffman, Gary Knight, Giancarlo Gomez, Jan Yannick, Jason Diger, Jeff McLean, Jeremy Adams, Jonas Erickson, Jordan Clark, Joseph Lamery, Kai Kennig, Laxma Tichukrahadi, Leon Saramelis, Mario Rodriguez, Matthew Darby, Matthew Clemente, Mingo Hagen, Patrick Flynn, Ross Phillips, Scott Steinbeck, Sean Odin, Stephen Klotz, John Wilson, and Yogesh Mathur. Thank you for sponsoring this podcast and all the open source work we do here at Orda Solutions. Yeah, we we'll definitely thank each and every one of you. As I always say, it's your hard-earned money you're putting on the line, and uh, we appreciate that almost as much as those who, uh, you know, put out their time too. So, you know, we we thank every one of you. Uh, the hard-earned dollars is, you know, the big the big step, and yeah, it's I can't believe we're 62 percent funded by patron supporters. It's pretty neat. It's a good feeling. So we're not just here talking to ourselves for no reason, right? People are getting something out of it, and uh, and we appreciate all of you. And thanks to everyone who joins us in the chat every week, too. That does mean a lot to us as well, that we have some conversation, and you guys can correct us and call us on our geography problems. Uh, we appreciate that. <laughs> <laughs> I do, because I, I will learn them, maybe, one day. <laughs> so, But anyway, so hope everyone has a great week. Thanks for joining us, and uh, yeah, we'll see you all next week. Bye now. Show notes for this episode can be found at cfmlnews.modernizeordie.io, where you can also subscribe to your favorite podcast player like Spotify or iTunes. We also have the link to YouTube to find more videos just like this. The music used in this podcast is under a royalty-free license from Sound.com and Bluetree Audio.